Emily Wilding Davison, 1872 to 1913, Deeds, Not Words. Here's a recent statue that you'll find in Morpeth of Emily Davison, wearing the suffragette sash across her shoulder and emptying a bowl of food onto the ground, as she would have done when she was in prison on hunger strike. Emily Davison probably got her stubbornness and iron determination from Grandma Mary Anderson, who had married a George Davison, whose first wife had died, leaving him with five young boys to bring up. And in 1827, Grandma Mary lost her father, her father-in-law, and her husband while she herself was pregnant. That didn't stop her. She carried on running the family business despite everything. On the paternal side of the family, the Davisons, they were descended from Scottish people and were gun makers by trade. On the maternal side, the Andersons, well, they, they were linked to the politicians and reformers of the day, important people such as Earl Grey, whose monument, of course, you can still see in the centre of Newcastle. Emily's father was born in Annick. He was a merchant. In fact, he had several jobs. He was a merchant, a land agent, and a director of several tramways. He spent uh, several years in India, where he married Sarah, with whom he had only nine children. And then on returning to England, he bought a property in Morpeth and settled down, continuing to prosper. But tragically, Sarah, his wife, died in 1866. Charles then decides to marry a Margaret Caisley, a second cousin who had been extremely useful as housekeeper. In fact, I must tell you, I think she was a little bit more than just a housekeeper, was Margaret, because she fell pregnant and Letitia was born out of wedlock. Charles married Margaret and then came Alfred, a certain Emily and little Ethel. But the family had already moved south for business reasons some time before Emily herself was born. Emily is born in October 1872 near Greenwich in London, but I don't think she would remember anything of that because while still a baby, the family moved to a village on the Hertfordshire Essex border. And it wasn't many years before Little's, em, Little Emily's temperament, character, began to show itself. She developed a strong social conscience and did voluntary work in soup kitchens in the East End of London with her mother. She appears to have been a high-spirited, daring and somewhat mischievous girl in whom the martial rather than the maternal instinct would dominate, a fighter, an arguer from her early days. And then the family move again in 1879. They rent a house in Twickenham, which will turn out to be a very bad move indeed. Emily attends a day school and also has the opportunity to spend a year in Dunkirk, where her elder sister Letitia now lives. <clears throat> And then between 1885 and 1891, Emily attends Kensington High School, but also manages to spend a year in Lausanne in Switzerland. And here's a picture of Emily as a young woman, described by her headmistress, Miss Hitchcock, as a keen and conscientious student an ardent cyclist and swimmer, a lover of the theatre. In 1891, she passes the higher certificate <clears throat> and moves on to Holloway College, 
where she worked for the Oxford Honours School in English Literature. And life must have seen, seemed full of promise at that time, but things were about to take a turn for the worse. In uh, 1891, there was an unsuccessful court case over the condition of the house that they had rented in a Twickenham. A problem, I think, with the drains, which had probably led to the death of little Ethel at six years old, who contacted, contracted diphtheria. There was at the same time a very unpleasant, acrimonious divorce of Emily's half-sister. Uh, these court cases, the financial burden, was borne by Emily's father, and led to his premature death in 1893, which was probably the date of Emily's first visit to Morpeth. Uh, Emily's mother was left with severe financial difficulties from the court case and the divorce. She's left a sole beneficiary with only about a hundred pounds for her immediate use and benefit. And so Margaret, Emily's mother, decides to move back north to near Morpeth, to the village of Long Horsley, to the house that you can still see to this day, <clears throat> a few miles north of Morpeth. This would happen in about 1895, and to make a living, Margaret opens a bakery in Long Horsley. Emily does not join her. Emily stays in Holloway College, but the £20 a term proves too costly and she has to move on. They do, however, manage to pay for one term at St Hugh's Hall, Oxford University, and Emily does uh, manage to obtain a first class degree, which of course would not be awarded in those days because Oxford did not award degrees to women until about 1920. Emily needed to find work. Money was tight. And the following 10 or 12 years from 1893 onwards would be pretty tough, grim years, I think, for Emily. She tried teaching in Birmingham and in Worthing. And I don't know whether she wasn't a particularly good teacher. She certainly didn't suffer fools gladly, but teaching wasn't really for her. She then tried being a resident governess in the home of a Sir Francis Leyland Barrett MP, looking after his children. And her free time was not spent in going to dances or clubs, oh no. Her free time in the evening was spent in continuing her studies in order to obtain and be awarded a degree. And here we can see a picture of her holding at last her degree in 1908. This was an external first class BA London degree in English and French. And if you look closely at Emily's face, you can see it's no longer a joyous, happy face. It's a face which bears the marks of the worries that she and her family have passed through. Well, with maturity also came militancy. The causes, I don't think, are difficult to discern. I think she'd been struck by the inequalities in divorce law from her sister's bitter experience. The law was very much weighted against women in divorce cases. Secondly, Emily had read probably distorted accounts in the newspapers of suffrage proceedings, the fight for women to get the vote. And in order to verify her impressions, she began to attend meetings of the WSPU, that is the Women's Social and Political Union. There could be a third reason. Maybe she was convinced, a bit like Joan of Arc, that she was called upon by God to fight for the suffragettes' cause. She's reported 
of having confided to her mother, I never do any of these things, these things being the acts of violence that we'll re hear about in a moment or two. I never do any of these things except under the influence, presumably meaning the influence of God or religion. I've already said, I think that these years were years that were grim and unhappy, certainly years of loneliness and a lack of sympathy. In the home of her pupils, where she was a governess, she would need to be careful what she said. If she expressed her opinions too forcibly, she might well have been thrown out. She was never either accepted really into Mrs. Pankhurst, the suffragette Mrs. Pankhurst's inner circle. Emily was always a headstrong woman who liked to act as a freelance agent, a loose cannon who wanted to do things her way. And in 1906, she took the step of joining as a full member the organisation, the WSPU. And we need to remind ourselves, of course, that although perhaps a majority, certainly of women, were in favour of women, of the women to have the right to vote, nevertheless, many women and men were against the violent methods that some suffragettes were using. Here's a cartoon showing a woman, of course, trying to brush back the tide of women's votes that appear to be coming and swamping her house. I think it's a bit of a vain attempt, in fact. Um, Morpeth Women's Suffrage Society, a very active society in the town, expresses the point quite well. Uh, during a meeting at the society, the mayoress of Morpeth, a Mrs. Carr, had presided, wishing to show by her presence that she was sympathetic with the movement. However, she also added that at the same time, she greatly deplored the tactics of those who, by their militancy, kept back the movement. Emily's old headmistress, Miss Hitchcock, says something rather similar. Although I did not share Emily's views, my affection for her and my appreciation of her character were unaltered. But Emily was decided very much on the course she would take, which would involve sometimes violence. On the 21st of June, 1908, she is chief steward at Marylebone Station, her first job, as it were, for the WSPU. And she has the responsibility of welcoming thousands of men and women to a mass meeting in Hyde Park for the suffragette movement. And then she becomes a paid worker for the WSPU shortly afterwards in 1910, takes a risk by giving up her teaching and devotes herself to the cause, managing, just I imagine, to support herself by writing, journalism and work for the WEA, the Workers' Educational Association. But it's from about 1909 that she begins a long series of violent, in some cases, violent attempts to gain the right of women to vote. She's arrested on a number of occasions in 1909 in Manchester, London and Newcastle. The very first time she's arrested, I think, is in March. She's arrested at Caxton Hall in London for attempting to serve Asquith, then the Prime Minister, with a petition and she's given a month's sentence. Of course, that doesn't discourage her in any way at all. And in July, she's arrested again. Again, it's in London, but this time for interrupting a meeting held by Lloyd George. No women being allowed to attend the meeting. She's imprisoned briefly and objects to being considered as a common criminal rather than as a political prisoner. 
So what does she do? She goes for the first, but not the last time, on hunger strike, and she fasts for 124 hours, losing one and a half stones. Things are going to get worse for Emily. In October, she's arrested at Radcliffe, which is just to the north of Manchester, during a budget meet meeting for the terrible crime of breaking a couple of windows. And she's sent to Strange Ways Prison in Manchester. Here in Manchester, in the prison, she goes on hunger strike and is force fed. <clears throat> Not a very pleasant process, I don't think. Here's an account of what happens from the medical journal The Lancet, written in 1912 by three doctors. One of them we we'll hear from again. He was called Mansell Moulin. In the opinion of the three doctors who wrote the article, uh, forcible feeding has no place in British prisons of the 20th century. It's a form, they claim, of severe physical as well as mental torture. In the picture we can see, this is of course the nasal method, where the prisoner will be held down while the tube is passed up through the nostrils. In most cases, this will of course uh, cause intense pain with headache, earache and gastric pain, preventing sleep in most cases after the feeding is over. The other normal method is the oral method, where an esophageal tube is passed through the mouth. In order to force the mouth open, the head is usually wrenched back by the hair over the edge of a chair. This will force the mouth open so that a steel gag can be inserted into the mouth. During the uh, force feeding, severe choking and vomiting usually occurs, and there's of course the danger of food passing into the larynx as well. In one case study, a victim in Birmingham is fed by the nasal tube, the doctors tell us. This victim, who is an old hand at the practice, this victim braced up her nerves and sat quietly in the chair instead of struggling and fighting as she had done on a previous occasion in Newcastle. <clears throat> when the tube was passed through her nose, this caused her to retch, vomit and suffocate. Somehow she found the strength to stand upright despite two or three wardresses trying to hold her down. She then sank back into the chair, exhausted. When the tube was finally withdrawn, she was afflicted with chronic asthma, and every time she took a deep breath, there was excruciating pain. She lay in agony, vomiting milk tinged with blood. In this treatment, Emily goes through not once, but 49 times. In between her protests and spells in prison, she appears to have made several trips north to Long Horsley to rest and to try to recover. Her own mother was experiencing a certain amount of unpleasantness in Long Horsley from people who disagreed very much with the methods that Emily was using to promote the suffragettes' cause. But at home, her activities were probably not discussed very much. She was given every opportunity just to rest and recover. But it didn't put her off in any way at all. In December 1911, things get rather more dangerous and violent when she sets fire to pillar boxes with paraffin soaked linen rags. She's immediately arrested by the police, this in fact being the, the object of the exercise. In 1912, she's sentenced to six months in Holloway for the crime of, the, of setting fire to pillar boxes. And it is here that she attempts to throw herself from a landing two or so stories high. She throws herself over the landing but is caught by a safety net. 
half an hour later, when the wardresses are not watching closely, she manages again to throw herself off the landing. This time she is just caught on the very edge of the net. She climbs over the net and hurls herself down the steel staircase, about a drop of 10 or 12 feet onto a stone floor, severely damaging her right shoulder and also her spine. It looks almost that she was more than prepared to give her life in the cause. In the same year, 1912, later in November, she's in Aberdeen, where she mistakenly attacks a Baptist minister with a whip at Aberdeen Station. She's mistaken him for Lloyd George, and she's sentenced to 10 days imprisonment, but released after she goes on hunger strike. And so we come to the sad climax of this little story. This is Long Horsley, the house we've already seen, and the plaque reads that it was from this house that Emily set out for the last time when she went back down south and would visit the races at Epsom. Emily Davison is not the first person to die in the suffragette cause. There had been three women before her, and there was a man in 1916 who died on hunger strike in Dublin. Wednesday, the 4th of June, 1913, is Derby Day at Epsom. <clears throat> and here is where the tragedy took place at Tattenham Corner. Let's take a closer look at this view now. And here it is. On the left, there is Emily Davison on the ground. On the right, in white, is a jockey. Well, what happened? Well, to be honest, we can't be exactly sure what happened, but a general version of the events might go something like this. Emily has gone to Epsom and finds herself initially behind the rail on the right at Tottenham Corner on the race track. The race is underway and one of the horses is owned by the king. The horse is called Anna. A little figure, Emily, bobs under the rail. The first bunch of horses thunder past. And then with great calmness, Emily walks out and stands in front of the second bunch of horses bearing down upon her. The first horse of the second bunch avoids Emily, but Anma, the king's horse, comes right into her. About half a ton, going at 30 miles an hour. Herbert Jones, the jockey, is thrown off and there is a terrible confusion of flying hooves, skirts and hat. Anma falls, but then gets up and runs on. Emily rolls over two or three times and then lies unconscious, never really to wake again. We can see another picture. Here it is from the Daily Sketch. Emily and the jockey, who's called Herbert Jones, they're brought to the cottage hospital in Epsom. The following day, Thursday, bleeding at the base of the skull is observed in Emily and unbelievably she receives hate mail at the hospital. Here's one of the letters that was sent to her, though I'm sure she never had the opportunity of reading it. The letter said, I am glad to hear you are in hospital. I hope you suffer torture until you die, you idiot. I consider you unworthy of existence. 
for what you have done, I should like the opportunity of starving and beating you to a pulp. Why don't your people find an asylum for you? On the Friday, a doctor, Mansell Moula, remember him? One of the writers of the article in The Lancet, Dr. Mansell Moula, who is now a vice president of the Royal College of Surgeons, operates on Emily to give temporary relief. But But on the Saturday, and more particularly the Sunday, Emily's heart and breathing gradually fail, and death is pronounced at 4.30 p.m. on the Sunday. In the meanwhile, the Suffragettes Union, the WSPU, had decorated her bed with the colours of the Union. The two members of Emily's family had travelled down from Morpeth and they felt very uncomfortable about this public display. They wanted their sister to be left in peaceful surroundings. The flags of the WSPU, their colours are removed, and Emily dies with no family present around her bed. And in a sense, there weren't one, but two funerals, both of which were perhaps stage-managed masterpieces. The WSPU using the occasion for propaganda for the cause, not probably to the wishes of Emily's family. And here in the photograph, we can see Emily has arrived in London. The body arrived at about 1.30 at Victoria Station, and there were more than 3,000 people ready to escort the body across London to King's Cross Station. The columns marched four deep, divided into three subsections of white and black and mauve. Behind a golden cross, 50 white-robed women preceded the coffin, bearing banners worked in white with a mauve background. And every woman wore a black band on her left arm, and carried also a Madonna lily, or a peony, or a purple iris. And then, as you can see in the picture, came the coffin on an open hearse drawn by four horses. Behind the coffin was a small group of clergymen who sympathised with the women's movement. And behind them, behind the hearse, came the empty carriage of Mrs Emmeline Pankhurst, who had been re-arrested on leaving her house to attend the procession, she had, however, been re-arrested. The procession makes its way through dense but largely respectful crowds while the dead march is played. The procession passes by Hyde Park and Shaftesbury Avenue and stops briefly at St George's Church for a memorial service. And then it's on to King's Cross for the 5.30 train to Newcastle. The coffin is carried in a large brake van draped in crepe and the colours of the WSPU. Six women comrades dressed in white with black shoulder sashes stand vigil over the coffin. And all the way north, curious onlookers at Grantham York, Darlington and Derham crowd the platforms hoping to catch a glimpse of the coffin. At Newcastle, the brake van is shunted into a siding and will remain there all night with Emily's comrades, the watchers of the dead who maintain their vigil. <clears throat> And then finally, on the following day, it's on to Morpeth on the 1040 train. At Morpeth, it takes more than an hour to unload some 200 floral tributes, and it's only about noon that the coffin itself can finally be unloaded. The suffragettes, who wear their prison badges, salute their dead comrade for the last time. 
a deliberate military atmosphere. A purple pall on which is worked a broad silver arrow is placed over the coffin and at the head of the coffin there is a marble slab from a loving Aberdeen friend. And we'll see this again in a minute or two. At the head of the procession, I'm not sure you could see it in the picture, there is one white robed woman who holds a gilded cross in the air. Following her come eight girls with Madonna lilies in single file, and then a young woman who carries the colours of the WSPU. Then comes the Reverend Wallace, a sympathiser from Seton Delaval. Following him, there are a series of banners, purple and white. Behind the first banner, march the Benwell District Silver Model Band, who play the Dead March and the French Marseillaise. The first banner, carried by women from the Newcastle branch of the WSPU, bears the words, fight on, God will give the victory. And then come the suffragettes in three sections of white and purple and black. And then, at last, comes the hearse itself, drawn by four black horses with white leading ropes, each held by a woman in white, quite clearly shown in the picture. Behind the hearse comes a suffragette guard, and then, only then, come five carriages for the family and dignitaries. And I don't think you would have seen the family inside the carriages. They were heavily veiled in black. They wanted, of course, something much more private than what they were receiving. At the rear comes a rolly, a trolley, covered with the wreaths. It was apparently glorious sunshine on that day, <clears throat> and about 20,000 people had come in from the surrounding countryside. It was almost like a holiday spectacle, and it took about 45 minutes to march past Carlisle Park to St Mary's Church, where the banners were furled and stacked and the white garbed suffragettes lined the path to the Lich Gate as a guard of honour. Here you can see the Lich Gate, where the majority of the crowd waited while the family proceeded inside to St Mary's Church, where a service was held, most people waiting in silence outside. The coffin is then borne to the family burial ground, which you can still, of course, visit today. And the coffin is laid in the earth with only the family present. Then many of the women in the procession file past the open grave and drop flowers upon the coffin. A banner with welcome Northumbrian hunger striker is buried with her and the wreaths are laid on the grave which was banked high with various tributes. And here you can see the marble slab which had been at the head of the coffin previously. This, it's not clear what this means. Um, one theory is that it is the uh, tribute from a barrister, Evelyn Morrison. Another theory says that it was from Emily's fiancé, though I've never heard that Emily did have a fiancé. Well, the public reaction to Emily's death ranges from the vindictive to the compassionate. One letter from the, uh, from the Morpeth Herald says that her case illustrates the deteriorating effect that the planning and carrying out of these militant schemes has upon the mental faculties of women. 
another uh, letter from the Evening Chronicle. It's signed by somebody who calls themselves will be sadder by far from Gateshead. And in this letter, this person says that they're quite in favour of giving widows and qualified persons the vote. But as to giving it to all women, well, come on, the idea, it's just ridiculous. This person says they feel sure that if women do get the vote, their tongues will make us sad, but their actions will drive us mad. Well, I don't know what you want to make of that. Another letter from the Chronicle is not much better, really. It suggests that a woman can do as much good or more without the vote as with it. To this person's mind, the letter writer, heaven has placed a woman where she is inferior to men in some respects, superior in others. But if women usurp the place of man, she is sure to neglect her own duty and disaster will ensue. This is signed anti-suffragettist. <clears throat> There's one letter, a final letter, again it's in the Chronicle, and this person has the courage, this woman has the courage to give her name and her actual address. It's a letter from an Emma Robson from 129 Cartington Terrace, Heaton, and the house still stands today. And she wrote this, there have always been, and there always will be, women who have the spirit and willpower to set public opinion at defiance, who are willing to act in whatever manner they think best for the furtherance and betterment of their cause. There is no doubt whatever but that we have lost an exceptionally clever and brilliant woman from our midst. We must all recognise the truly British grit, dogged perseverance and courageous spirit, which have been characteristic of the deed, and feel something of a passing regret that her mighty heart has felt the necessity of such a tremendous sacrifice. And I leave you not really with answers, but with a few questions. Well, we never really know if Emily did act alone, or there's a theory that she picked out the short straw, that several women prepared to go through the act of stopping the king's horse. Emily, perhaps, but we never know, drew the short straw. Plan B, I think we can be a bit more decisive about. Um, it would seem that the obvious thing to do, if you wanted to stop the king's horse and make a public protest, would be to try to do that, not on the racetrack itself, but in the paddock beforehand, where the horses would be paraded prior to the race. Well, maybe that's what Emily would have liked to have done, but of course, the constables or the police would have noted her as a troublemaker and she would have been it would have been impossible for her probably to do that so she fell back on plan b that we've seen at tottenham corner the motive well in a way we can answer that question in one way it was simply protest against the so-called cat and mouse act or more properly the prisoners temporary discharge for ill health act of April 1913. Here, a prisoner uh, suffering from a hunger strike striking could be released temporarily in order to recover. But then when they had recovered sufficiently, they would then be rearrested and brought back to prison, as it happened to Mrs. Pankhurst, for example. But her motive, well, maybe it was simply to stop the race. More likely, she intended to pin a flag on the bridle of the king's horse. Or maybe she simply wished to walk across to the cameras on the opposite side of Tattenham Corner to make a more public protest. Well, we never know. Finally, 
was this attempted suicide. The inquest returned a verdict of death by misadventure and in her effect, effects was found a return, a ticket to London, a ticket to a dance and a diary with appointments for next week. But of course we cannot be sure. But just when I want to dismiss the suicide theory, I'm reminded of what she tried to do on Holloway Prison when she attempted three times to throw herself over the balcony or landing. We will never know. Well, after these very sad events, the Davis and family wished, of course, to grieve in private. And there was a closing of ranks in the family, a conspiracy of silence. And now her nearest relative is a gentleman in Sydney, Australia. We can't even ask the final qu uh, answer. The final question was her sacrifice effective? Did it bring votes to women any closer? Many women did get the vote in 1918, but many others had to wait another 10 years after that. Well, was her sacrifice worthwhile or not? Well, we can never know because, ladies and gentlemen, a little event intervened called the Great War or the First World War. And during the war, women showed that they were just as capable of men of carrying out all sorts of difficult, heavy tasks, which meant, of course, that by 1918, it was virtually impossible to deny some women at least the vote. We can never answer that question. I leave you with more questions than answers. Thank you very much.